Hi everyone, and thank you for joining me for today's open source in FinTech meetup. My name's Claire Cox and I work for the technology consultancy ScotLogic, and I'm one of the organizers of this meetup, which we run in partnership with Finos. If you're not already a member of the meetup, I'll put the links to all of the regional meetups in the chat box. And if you live in Yorkshire, as I do, you'll be pleased to hear that we have a Leeds meetup starting later this year, at which point we'll hopefully be able to meet with each other face to face. In case you didn't see my email earlier this week, we're going to be rotating the physical location of these meetups from the autumn and we'll be live streaming at each event. So you'll still have the choice of dialing in if you prefer to do so. Plus the benefit of running these events digitally is that we get to welcome an amazing international lineup of speakers like we're doing right now. So joining us from Paris, we're delighted to be joined today by Roberto Di Cosmo, Director of Software Heritage, an exciting initiative that aims to create the world's largest archive of open source code. And from New York, we're joined by Stephen Goldbaum and Attila Mihaly of Morgan Stanley, who will be telling us about their fantastic new open source tool, Morphere. Do let us know what you thought about today's event in the very short survey that will pop up at the end. And if you have a question for our speakers, pop them into the Q&A box and we'll take as many as we can at the end of each presentation. But without further ado, let me pass you over to our first speaker, Roberto. Okay, thanks Claire for giving me the floor. So it's a pleasure to be uh, here with you today. And I will take some time to tell you more about software heritage, which is a revolution in infrastructure for open source for software in general. But let me start by a, a very short introduction about my, myself so you know uh, who is talking to you. So I'm Italian, as you may hear from my accent, I'm a computer science professor in Paris. Now I'm working at TIRIA, which is a national research organization for computer science. I have been teaching and doing research for 30 years. If there are mathematicians in the attendance, you might like to know that my Erdos number is three. That's a private mathematician joke. If you don't know, forget. Uh, I spent 20 years working in the free and open source software movement in different roles and capacities and 10 years, the last 10 years, building and directing structure for the common good. A member of the National Committee for Open Science in France, I work in many, many different uh, projects and the, my key mission today is to uh, uh, see where software heritage into the, the largest software archive in the world. Uh, that being said, a little bit of a context. So uh, you know that open source is growing, actually. A few years ago, some 10 years ago, uh, you remember Mark Andreessen used this uh, famous phrase that software is eating the world. And what he was meaning there is actually uh, a lot of software com companies were actually outperforming traditional companies or are even buying them out. Um, but if software is eating the world, I'm sure you noticed that actually open source is eating up the software world. Because today, uh, when you develop software, you cannot, you can no longer reboot everything from scratch. You need to reuse. And actually, there are interesting survey one from Sonar Types a few years ago that showed that basically 80 to 90% of every new application is just reusing components coming from outside. And typically, these components come from the open source world. Now, uh, the fact that open source is becoming the general trend and the norm is a good thing for me. I'm an open source advocate. But to be honest, this also comes with some kind of concerns. So typically, uh, uh, open source is the new rule. But where it come from? I mean, you can find a software project on GitHub or uh, on Bitbucket or on some distribution like NPM or CTAN or CRAN, whatever, uh, different package system like Debian, all forges like uh, Soft Forges or places like Maven. So the problem is source code is spread all over the place. And then the question is, do you know where the software you are using or reusing actually coming from? I mean, the, I mean, the software that you ship, that you acquire, that you use, and, and, and the software that may have a bug or a vulnerability or an issue in there. Do you know where it actually comes from? I mean, this is a real concern. And in, uh, if you heard the, the recent breaking news from the uh, US uh, in the last week, 
you have seen that the, the President of the United States issued an executive order at the beginning of May uh, about cybersecurity for the nation. And one point you find in section four is exactly enhancing software supply chain security, uh, which includes, among other things, the issue of ensuring the integrity and the provenance of the open source component that you use inside your software. So in some sense, if you can let me use an acronym that I'm pushing a little bit, uh, in the banking uh, environment that you know even very, very well, there is an obligation, which is KYC, right? know your customer. Well, for software, we basically see a new obligation, which is coming, which is KSW, that is know your software. Where does it come from? Uh, can you tra track it across the, the supply chain? And, and why do you want to do this kind of tracking? Well, basically because you need to find the software which is relevant for your application, make sure this software will be available later on. The fact that it is on some place like GitHub doesn't guarantee it will be there tomorrow or in 20 years. So there you need an archive, you need a system with identifiers. Uh, can you check nobody tampered with it? So is it really the right code? Then you need cryptography, you need signatures, etc. Uh, also traceability. I mean, who actually developed what? What piece of software ended up into another part of your system? So there you need a, a global uh, uh, instrument to analyze the provenance of all the pieces of software around the world. If you want to make sure that you can rebuild every piece of software that your system is based upon, then you need to ensure reproducibility, which is a different difficult issue, which is also related to open science, but that's another story. And overall traceability, safety, security, et cetera, et cetera. So you see, we need to become professional in using open source software. And this means addressing all these issues. And to address this kind of issue, we need a coordinated global effort to build an infrastructure that allows us to track all of the open source software. And we not want to have this kind of infrastructure being really open, transparent, shared, common, not just in other business. It is something which is catering a common infrastructure for all of us. Well, the good news is that we have started some seven years ago working on this infrastructure, even much earlier than uh, industry started noticing the importance of these needs. And this is Software Heritage. Let me introduce to you Software Heritage. Software Heritage is an initiative, in a nutshell, whose goal is to actually go out, collect every single line of source code ever written with all its history of development, not just as a point in time, every, all the history of its development. Make sure it is not lost, as we preserve it, and make it available for everybody. So this has, of course, a, an interest in preserving the history of computing, that's a kind of a museum, but it is way more than that. It is actually an instrument to analyze the evolution of software and pre prepare better software for the future. So if you want to understand in a few words what we are actually building, we are creating a reference catalog where you can find and reference all the source code, no matter where it comes from comes from a project on GitHub, from an old project on SourceForge, from a package in Debian, from an NPM package, who cares? We track all of this and present to you a uniform catalog that allows to identify all the pieces of source code. Second, we are building a universal archive. So it is not just a portal pointing you to the places where the software is available. It's much more than that. It is a place where we actually archive the full copy of all the software we are indexing today. And we keep maintaining for you forever. I mean, or until the next epidemic uh, rules out or uh, I mean, destroys the rest of the earth. And then last but not least, this is a key building block for a worldwide research infrastructure that allows us to uh, analyze the evolution of all software source code, leveraging people from academia and from industry, and from industry working together the same way we have been doing for exploring the galaxy around us through telescope for decades. Okay, so uh, software heritage is designed as a common infrastructure. So you see you know, this building block uh, here is in charge of collecting, preserving, and sharing all the source code. And it is designed to enable application in different verticals, 
One is in cultural heritage, that's the reason why we have agreements with UNESCO. Another is in industry, this is the reason why I'm talking to you today. Another is in research, open science, and in education. And this is the reason why we have so many connections to different ministry of research or public administration, etc. This is not just slide where we will see it live in a short demo in a few minutes, but basically, uh, we have started our archiving work in 2015, and we have already archived over 150 million projects, which boil down to more than 10 billion unique source code files, uh, developed by tens of millions of uh, developers worldwide. And this infrastructure is built on some pillars, so technologically, everything we do is open source. You can look into what we do. We can also replicate it. You can replicate it. Uh, and this is important for transparency and for sustainability in the long term. In the, what we keep in the archive are intrinsic identifiers computed from the object itself, basically cryptographic hashes, if we know that. Uh, and, and so this is the kind of identification which is persistent over time. And we keep information about where we find what. So for every piece of information we have in the archive, we can tell you where we found it, when and how we ingested in the archive. And as an organization, all this is designed as a non-profit, multi-stakeholder, international organization open to all. Now, why I'm telling you that this is a revolutionary infrastructure for open source? But first of all, if you look at the way it is built, I do not have time today to go into the details. If somebody is interested, he will uh, actually take some question about this. But uh, what you basically do, we get all the history development of all the pieces of software project out, out there, no matter where they come from. And we put it in a single gigantic graph that traces the development of software all over the planet since the beginning. And this is not any graph. It is actually a Merkle graph, which is a key piece of technology used in blockchains, used in distributed file system, uh, in the Web 3.0, etc. So we are basically building half of a blockchain for software development. It is also a pillar for open science. When you do open science, you want to keep access to the articles, to the data, but also to the source code used to process the data. And we are providing this recent archive for the research community. And last but not least, we keep all this information in a single uniform data structure, which is the key element to actually allow uh, machine learning application or, or massive data analysis application, which are called in, in, in my research community, big code analysis. So you see these four uh, uh, small points of view gives you an idea of why this is way more than an archive. It is actually really a revolutionary infrastructure. Now, one of the consequences of the fact that we use not traditional archive, but a gigantic Merkle graph to store all the information about the software is that every single artifact in the archive comes with an intrinsic identifier which we call the software heritage identifier or Swiss, which looks at something like this, you see? So you have a prefix, SWH, tells you that this is a software identifier. Then you have a schema version for the uh, identifier. For now, we have version one. Then you have a tag that tells you what this is the identifier actually identifying. And this tag can be CNT for a content, DIR for a directory, mm -hmm. RED for a vision, release, RED for a release, or a snapshot for a full status of the version control system. And finally, you have here a hash, a cryptographically strong hash computed from the object itself. I mean, for contents, this is something everybody knows how to do. For more complex objects, you need to follow the Merkle construction, the traditional Merkle construction. We also provide uh, uh, extra uh, qualifiers that allow you to tell you not only this is a piece of artifact that I'm interested in, but I'm also interested in this artifact as found on GitHub in this particular uh, location. Uh, when this repository was in a particular state, and here you have another identifier for the state of creation. And then you can say, hey, what interests me are the lines between 64 and 72 of a file which is called the burn body burn. Uh, 
that is found in this path in this particular revision. You see, so you have a full context of where you found what. I mean, this is an emerging standard. It is now part of the SPDX 2.2 release of the Linux Foundation standard for our software provenance and traceability. Uh, it is also uh, identified in Wikidata with a specific property. And uh, uh, in the slide that we share online, you can click on these links and you actually, behind the links, the blue links here, you have one of these identifiers, you can get to the position with exactly the, uh, um, the piece of code you're interested in. So this is basically the moment where I should stop talking and kind of give you a demo. Let's try. So that, for example, let's click on this. What, see what happens. You see? Now we are following this link here. And this brings us, let me try to put this a little bit bigger for you to read. You see, now we are browsing inside the software engine archive an interesting piece of the source code of the Apollo 11 uh, guidance computer. And you see that here you have all the information. It is inside this particular revision. It was shared on a GitHub repository in this particular uh, repository. And this is a status of the code as of May 1st, 2021, when we took a snapshot of it. You see? And so this is the particular interesting because when you have a link like this one, you can share it with a colleague, for example, to point out a vulnerability, to point out a relevant part of your uh, algorithm or, uh, or, uh, or, uh, or a relevant part of the software, or a part of a specification for the supply chain uh, traceability. And then wherever you are on this software that is interesting for you, again, you click on the first line, click on the shift click on the second line, then you pull out this permalinks uh, tab here. And you see you have the core identifier here with the hashes and the contextual information. You can copy this permalink, put it in a piece of documentation, share it on a Twitter or, or a chat or whatever, put it in a contract. And when you click on this link again, now I'm simulating clicking on a link by copy pasting it, what that is that you will be brought back again in front of the exact same code snippet as before in exactly the same context. And notice the reason why this is actually revolutionary with respect to what we are used to do if you're a developer on other development platform is that you are looking at an archive. So this software will stay here, cannot be removed. And the second point is that the identifier we are providing, these permalinks which are here, do not depend at all on the platform, development platform, or the version control system used for uh, developing this piece of software. Okay, so even if it is a JavaScript package for an NPM, you will have the same kind of identifier, so uniform identification. Well, okay, so this was, I think, enough to give you an idea what this is. There are tons of other things that you can do. So let me go back to the slides and tell you a little bit more about why this is interesting for industry. So this is a very short selection of use cases coming from industry. If you use open source software, for example, you know that open source software comes with a license. A license gives you a lot of rights, but also some obligations. So for example, typically, if you embark in an application of yours, a piece of source code, which is under GPL or LGPL or MIT or BSD and generating all other licenses, you need at least to say thanks to the authors or give it, make available a copy of the source code you are reusing. And this is an obligation which is called open source complete and corresponding source code obligation for distribution. Well, the good news is that since we are a universal archive, if you archive a source code in software heritage, the only thing you need to care about is getting this identifier, the single identifier that identifies a full repository, keep it and distribute it only that because the rest is done by software edge. And this is a use case that comes out of Intel. Therefore, traceability and integrity, you want to say in a given contract for a given agreement or for some kind, I mean, you name it, uh, I'm referring to exactly this version of the code. 
how can you be sure that this version of the code will be available? You can check nobody tamper with it, and this is exactly the reference for you. Well, this is a use case for the Open Invention Network, which is running a large operation for protecting the Linux system definition. Well, now what they do is they archive the reference source code for Linux system definition and software heritage and track it and verify its integrity using these software heritage identifiers. This has a real application already in place, but there is much more. For example, you can have issues related to compliance. I mean, can, can I check that the piece of software which is in my system uh, is actually original belonging to me, or is it copied from some place else? And where is it copied from? Uh, who, is in, who is the real author? Who is entitled to say if I may have a right to copy it or not? And here we have collaboration ongoing with uh, companies like Intel, PostID, or CAS, and others. Security, again, and checking that the version of software which is used is exactly the one which was referenced in the archive at the given moment in time. Here there are some ongoing collaboration with a working group which is led by the US Department of Commerce, for example. And again, you have supply chain management, long-term archive, etc. You name it, you can add your use case there. So what is the road ahead? So first of all, we want to build an international non-profit initiative for the long term. On one side, we need people that share our vision and we need to be legitimate as an international non-profit organization. This is the reason we have this agreement with UNESCO, which is a stable of operation on many things we are doing with them. And many, many, many organizations are endorsing our work. You can click on these links and you will find the full list are over 50. On the other side, as always, well, you need to foot the bill, right? So who pays for all this? Well, we base this operation on donors, membership, and sponsors. So INRIA is a key entity, which is a research organization in France that started the project, that accepted to fund the initial phase of the project some six, seven years ago. But in the meanwhile, you, have, you see here a growing number of sponsor and members that comes from a, a public research organization, large IT companies, banks, like Société Générale, and then you have uh, universities and different kind of entities, you have GitHub, you have VMware, uh, academia, etc. And there is a lot of white space, so we hope to have more of these people coming on board, maybe some of you in the future. And so if there are companies interested in getting involved into this uh, undertaking, actually, we even created a source code deposit interest group for people who are interested in depositing and tracking software source code, which is relevant for them with different levels, etc. So on board as members in this particular space, we have the Open Invention Network Organization, VMware on the industry side, others are coming, and several people coming from the academic world and from public administration. If you want to join or want to know more, you just can contact them us or, or me directly to this uh, specific mail address here. So let me conclude with a, the, a, a kind of a call to action. So I believe I have given you enough elements to understand what we are up to, right? So it is basically on one side, recovering the past, being a gigantic library of Alexander source code, but on the other side, being an incredible instrument for tracking and analyzing and seeing the evolution of software for the future. So here there is a value uh, for academia, there is value for industry, there is value for society as a whole. So I think I will stop here because 22 minutes, I think I should, I'm right on time. If you have any question, just do not hesitate in asking. And Claire, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Roberto. That was fantastic. And we have got lots of questions coming in. So I'll I'll get straight into them. We'll take a few minutes of questions and we will still have some time for questions uh, again at the end. So do keep getting them in. So first one, why is reporting missing, i.e. the ability to register that you're using a piece of software and wish to be informed if defects, etc., are discovered? Ah, that, 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 that's, that's not why it is not available. The question is, when will it be available? And that depends exactly on the partners we have. The way we are working in, in, in software heritage, we have so many things in our drawers, so many things in our blueprints uh, that are just waiting to be developed. The only point is that 
this is a long-term operation. We plan to do even that. Of course, that's in a very interesting application, but we prioritize what we hear from our current sponsor. I mean, from the companies and people that have skin in the game. So the, the, our priority there today are designed that way. Okay. Okay. It's just donors, right? So you are not buying a contract with us, but of course, if I need to hear somebody, I prefer to hear from people that have skin in the game. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Next one. Do you have any plans to add data from some of the more legacy open source platforms, such as SourceForge? They are old, but hold some important data that's more at risk than the data from GitHub, etc. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very good point. So the ambition of software heritage is actually to get everything under the sun. So it was natural to start with GitHub because it is the biggest fish in the pond right now. But of course, we also wanted to track SourceForge, but keep in mind that SourceForge is an old uh, legacy platform. So it didn't have the kind of modern APIs or event feed that allows to easily get all its content. So it took some time and actually I'm happy to say that the Sloan Foundation in the US have granted us some money that we use to give out grants to expert contributors. And one of the expert contributions started to work on SourceForge just a couple of months ago. So this is coming. Uh, hold your breath. You can hold your breath. I hope in a few weeks you will see SourceForge on board. And there is still a little bit of money there for, for contributors who want to come and uh, build the connectors to actually harvest the content from other platforms. We do not do just scraping, right? I mean, we do it professionally. So you want to really go there and collecting and see if there is something new. So it is a, not a one-shot operation. We need a real connector for that. Sounds great. I'm going to squeeze in one more question before we pass over to the, the next speakers. So how about private repository? Do you have the right to review if something is private and personal invite only? Ah, that, that's another extremely good question. So let me be very transparent. Currently, we archive only what is publicly available. So we do not archive private repository from anywhere for different reasons. One is a technically I cannot, unless you want me to archive it, I cannot get your private repository is private right but there are we would like to archive also private repository but this should be on demand as a kind of a escrow service that brings value to the industry or the people that want this software to be archived okay so we will not do it just for fun we try to make it useful for the people so sharing the same technology but this requires extra funding, extra money, extra infrastructure to actually keep the private data separate from the public data, keep it in an escrow in such a way that when later on you will want to make it available or you want to do something with that, it will be easy to merge it to the, to the public data. But it requires extra effort to keep a separate infrastructure. And again, we are listening to the people around the table. The people with skin in the game didn't ask for this yet. So we are not moving into that space, but it is definitely part of our long-term roadmap. That sounds great. Well, let's wrap that up there for now. Like I say, we might get some more questions for you coming in as, a, as the, the event goes on. So thank you very much for that, Roberto. Thanks, Claire. And you can relax now while we pass you over to Stephen Goldbaum and Attila Mihaly from Morgan Stanley, who are going to be telling us about more fear. So over to you guys. Hi, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Stephen Goldbaum. I'm here with Attila Mihaly. Uh, we're both from Morgan Stanley. And we are here to give an overview of Morpher, which is a project that we contributed to FinOS, I think, about a year ago. Uh, so first off, what does Morpher do? Uh, there we go. Yeah. So Morpher, is the, the central idea of Morpher is to share business logic. Uh, so we want to share business logic across people and across technologies. We want that business logic to be able to be understood by by business users, by developers. Um, and we also wanna be able to process that business logic in useful ways. Uh, so first off, what do I mean by business logic? I think we're all pretty comfortable with the idea of sharing data. Um, there's a lot of different formats to share data. 
we're probably a little less comfortable with what does it mean to share business logic. Um, we're actually talking about sharing business logic the same way that we share data. Um, but by business logic, what we mean is the essence of an application. If you were to talk to a business expert about the application, what would they, what language would they use to describe it? So we're really talking about an application in the language of the business user. And that's really where we want to get to. We want to get to the point that we have our technology in the same language as the business user so that we're bridging that divide between technology and business. So let's take an example. Um, let's, this example is surfboard rentals. So imagine a, a, a surfboard company that wants to have a system to reserve surfboards to, to rent. Um, so an obvious question would be, well, how many boards are available to rent at any given point in time? Uh, so if you're the business user, probably our business user thinks of this in terms of, of a calculation or very holistically for sure. So they're probably thinking um, the available surfboards are the amount of surfboards that I have in, in the store right now, minus any reservations that I have. Um, and then plus all the, uh, maybe the, the boards that are scheduled to be returned. Drilling into that, we see that there's a little more nuance that the current inventory is a, a sum of the boards in the store. Uh, the reserved inventory, it, uh, you know, what the reservations that have been done, maybe we, we want a little buffer there because not all the reservations show up. And same thing with the, the probable returns. Maybe, you know, people really don't, they're having fun, so they don't bring the, the boards back on schedule that often. So we put a little buffer in there. And so that's how the business thinks of our application. Now, when they hand that off to the technology team, what the technology team does is they divvy that up. We, we start splitting it up into the best technology for the, um, for the job. So we might think of, well, to keep track of the current inventory, we want that in a database and they're really good at doing things like sums and whatever. Uh, and so that's the best place for that. For running the calculation, we might move that to uh, microservices and a service-based architecture. And then, you know, maybe we have GPS location on the surfboard so we can track the surfboards and see which ones are probably going to get returned or something like that. So that's in the kind of an event streaming architecture. And so we've, we've taken what was a holistic view and we've split it up all over the place into different technologies, which is great. That's the way it should be. Uh, probably all of us have experienced that over time as the application evolves, the holistic view goes away. And if there was any documentation, maybe it gets, sta it gets stale. Um, and so what's left is just the, the technology view of the, the application. So we have the database, we have the microservice, we have the streaming, making any sense of that holistically becomes a challenge. So it's just like, like a scrambled egg, you know, once you break it and scramble it, it's, well, it's impossible to put it back together. Well, maybe it's not impossible for technology, but it's still very difficult to go in and say, you know, here's the database stuff, here's the microservice stuff. I understand what this application is supposed to do based on all these pieces. It's, it's very difficult to do. And that affects us in the sense that, well, now it's difficult to migrate and evolve our, our, our application. So, you know, if we don't really know what the database is supposed to be doing, it's going to be very difficult to migrate database technologies or maybe take that, that out of the database, or maybe we want to make the whole thing streaming. I mean, you know, it's going to be very difficult to do something like that if we don't have a holistic view. Um, and similarly, it's going to be very difficult to make business changes um, if we don't really know what the application is supposed to do. Or we know what it's supposed to do, but we're not sure that the application is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and so we want to get back to this state of, well, let's think of the application holistically. Let's think of it in terms of the business language. And can we get to the state where if we have the application in the form of the business language, can we automate all the rest? So basically, you know, back to what developers do, they take this business sense of the, of the application and we split it up and write different technologies. Can we maybe automate that um, in the production of these, 
of, of converting the business logic into these different technologies. Uh, and so that's basically what, what Morpher was, was designed for. Um, so drilling into what it actually is at the core, it is a structure of basically a, a data structure for saving business logic. Um, it pulls from programming language theory uh, in order to do that. And so in programming language theory, that's called an intermediate, intermediate representation or an intermediary language. Uh, we generally call it an IR. Um, and so that's the structure that we've, we've consolidated on in order to store our business logic. Um, and so that what that does is that allows us to have tools to to, to write the business logic in different technologies, maybe in, in other programming languages, in maybe tools like decision trees or something like that, um, compile that into the Morpher IR. And then once it's in that data structure, then produce tools that then do interesting things with it. Um, and so some of the interesting things that we do are, well, obviously we wanna be able to execute that. And so, there are other programming languages that are great for executing um, business logic. So we, we transpile into those languages. Um, similarly, we, we can transpile into database languages and database structures and schemas and, and you know, all the things that we need to do in order to make the database work. We can automate that and transpile into that. Um, and so that, really targets that whole efficiency and the agility uh, aspect of being able to change technologies under the cover without risking the business logic. And that's something that we saw in the enterprise a lot was that as the technologies evolved and we kept rewriting uh, our applications to use those technologies, each time we rewrote the application, it was a considerable risk to the business because we might get some of the business logic wrong or we might forget something. Or as I said before, if people totally forgot what the business logic was supposed to do, we might we might miss something very important. Um, and so similar to that is, well, one of the interesting things we can do is process all that information into tools that allow users to interact with the application and understand how the application is supposed to work and how it actually is working. And that is targeted at the feedback cycle between IT and uh, everyone else. So the business users and IT, you know, there's a feedback cycle of specifications and then implementation and then review. And then, you know, the, this cycle, we wanna see if we can make that cycle more efficient um, and make it faster to do and more natural for everybody. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, so I, as I said, it, we, we, by doing it this way, it turned out that not only did we make it easier to change technologies, but we also ran into a whole bunch of other interesting things that we, we found out that we could do, like automating testing tools, um, basically doing things like replaying, like if the if the business wanted to know why we uh, an application made a decision at a particular time, um, being able to go back and audit that and replay it, um, do things like automatically register the, the, the data and the lineage so we can track data flow through the application automatically. Um, and then even do things that are interesting on a programming language perspective, like, um, use certain programming languages for what they're best at. So for things like verification and testing, some languages are better at others than others. So by having this common IR in the middle, we could write it in one language and then use other languages to do verification and things like that. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it off to Attila and he will review some of these things. Yep. Thank you, Stephen. So, uh, let me dig a bit deeper into the, the specifics. Um, so at the core of Morpher, as, as Stephen already mentioned, is the that IR, that intermediate representation. Um, so how does that look like? Um, so what you can see on the on the left here is um, uh, the, an example from um, the 
the business problem that Stephen presented, which was uh, renting surfboards. So as you can see, we have the available surfboards as an input and the requested surfboards and another, another um, input. And uh, what we are trying to answer is whether to we should reject the request or actually reserve the surfboards. And then some there's actual an extra option of allowing uh, or not allowing uh, partial rentals, uh, meaning that you if you ask for ten, you might just get five uh, reserved. So uh, obviously this is a simplified example, and it's um, and it's not exactly uh, finance related, but you can probably make the relationship that we have a lot of similar problems in finance. Um, so uh, this is described in um, the language called Elm, which uh, which is a language that we mainly use for describing the business logic, but it could really be anything. Uh, we have many other. Uh, inputs, we can go from legacy DSLs or like even decision tables. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to use Elm to um, to describe your business logic to begin with. Um, so then we take that um, syntax and parse it into this intermediary structure, it's data structure that uh, captures uh, the essence of that business logic. If you are somewhat familiar with, um, with programming languages, you will recognize some of those building log blocks if then else, reference, variable, those are all uh, familiar concepts probably. Um, so this is, the, this is actually the, the actual uh, data structure that we are using uh, with some additional type information mentioned in there um, just to give more information. So the other thing that I should mention is that you, we use functional programming constructs. And the, the reason we chose that is that functional programming is simple but powerful um, and it provides uh, really good correctness guarantees out of the box. Uh, but most importantly, the, that it has no side effects. It doesn't, pure functional programming doesn't allow any side effects, which means that um, given the same function uh, with the same inputs, you are guaranteed to get back the same results every single time, no matter where you run it, in what environment, and it doesn't affect the environment. There's no state in the, um, in the whole equation. So that makes, that is crucial because that makes it possible to execute the same calculation across different technologies uh, and, and over time uh, in a consistent manner. Um, so, okay, so what do we do with this business log logic um, in this data, captured in this data format? So one of the things uh, that we do is um, we provide this UI uh, that immediately after you wrote that business logic in Elm, um, is uh, automatically generated. Um, and basically it's a, it's a visualization of the business logic. So as you can see, uh, the UI chose to show a decision tree for this specific piece of business logic. It, it is fully automated. So it makes its own decisions about how to show the business logic in the most efficient way. Uh, so it, it can show it as a decision table as well, depending on uh, what the structure of it looks like and, and other ways as well. So besides just showing the business logic, uh, it also allows us to immediately start interacting with it. So uh, let me just put in some input values here. So say I, uh, we have a dozen available surfboards and we wanna, um, wanna request, uh, wanna reserve uh, six of those, and obviously the answer is yes, we can reserve it, so we get we get six reserved. So what if we go a bit crazy and we want to reserve 60? Uh, interestingly, we still get a, a some reserved, but uh, based on that logic, it will be the minimum, like uh, the it will just be the available surfboard, so we will have a dozen uh, reserved. This is because allow partial is set to true. Okay, so let's see what happens if we don't allow partials, then it it rejects it. So we can immediately see that the business logic behaves exactly as we wanted. Um, we, a business user can look at this and play around with this. It may be on a, on a call with IT. Um, so the whole uh, process becomes really interactive and, and it's, a, it's a very tight feedback loop. And this is crucial again, because normally this process takes weeks or months because it has to go from a documentation that the business writes or like, uh, or uh, business analysts write, uh, then IT interprets that, puts them in a specific programming language, and then it has to be deployed in order to, for the business to even look at it. And they only see the result, which also makes it more difficult. They don't actually see the details of how we came up with that eventual result. Um, so this cuts down that multi-month process to seconds, potentially. Um, 
so and it you can think of it as a live specification as well and live documentation that gets that never gets still which is which is also a pretty big deal because documentation in general is always stale in our environment right we we write it at the beginning of the the project and of course an application's business logic evolves over time and we never keep the documentation up to date because there's simply no capacity for for that um, so one other way that we use uh, this business logic or this this UI is to actually explain the calculations after the uh, the application has been deployed. So uh, imagine that on day two, uh, if the business user thinks that we made the wrong decision, they can actually go back and and check why we did that. And it's especially important in a highly regulated environment where a regulator might come back and ask if uh, five years ago when we made a decision why why we did that and this provides a really easy way to explain it um, so okay that's the next step um, now we know that the specification is is good uh, as much as we could figure out on the fly uh, but now we actually want to verify if we covered all the edge cases and everything so uh, for that we also provide um, uh, some tooling that is semi-automated um, so it gives you a nice framework that makes it easy to add those test cases. As you saw, uh, you are able to specify the inputs, uh, but now you can specify the expected output as well. And then the system checks if the two are the same. And so again, you get BDD style checks in seconds, which is usually at least a multi-day process, but uh, maybe it can take even more time than that when you are integrating it into an actual like general purpose programming language. And I also have to mention that FP out of the box, functional programming out of the box give you guarantees that, um, uh, that are beyond our usual general purpose programming languages. Um, so we are starting with, uh, with better um, logic uh, out of the box. So, so now we, we know that the business logic is exactly correct. It's behaving in every single edge case as we expect. Uh, so what do we do next? Um, so uh, now we have to actually deploy the application into our infrastructure. So in order to do that, we need to get some, uh, some code in some actual programming language, some general purpose programming language. Now, the good news is that uh, beyond just uh, the easiness of uh, visualizing data, it is also very easy to take that data and turn it into um, some business logic again, turn it back into business logic in a specific general purpose programming language. It's much easier to go from data to logic than to go from logic to data. Um, so we do that we using code generators. So it, those automate a really error prone manual process, which is, so normally um, the developers would look at the spec and start implementing in this uh, target languages manually. And of course they make a lot of mistakes, um, humans do. Um, what's nice about code generators is that they are applications. So they don't, um, don't make one of mistakes and you can improve them over time through testing. So uh, maybe it makes a mistake in the beginning. You detect that, you, you write a test for it, you fix it and it never comes back in the future. It will never make that same mistake again. So over time, it just becomes so much better than, than humans. And it's also scalable, um, like there is no limitations on that. Um, so beyond the, the pure um, productivity and quality uh, improvements that this brings us, it also puts us uh, in a completely different uh, ball game when, when it comes to evolving our technology. Uh, so normally we have this huge risk of manually rewriting our business logic when we chose to say move from one technology to the other. So for example, we had this business logic in JavaScript running in Node.js and we want to move to the JVM for performance reasons. Uh, we have to actually have to think really carefully whether we do that because if we make a mistake in the process that has a huge price uh, a huge price tag especially in finance where you um, where if you make a mistake it can lead to huge financial losses uh, so there's a really strong motivation to keep your old technology which is which is really bad because um, it, it produces an environment with a with a bunch of uh, uh, technology, te technical debt, um, and the, the, the ability to, from, from, to move from one to the other, uh, basically without risk and uh, with really 
um, low amount of manual investment, um, that puts us puts you in a completely different situation with much less technical debt. Um, and with that, I'm done with uh, the part of the presentation and uh, we are ready for some Q&A. Thank you. That's great. Thank you both very much. And yeah, there's lots of questions coming through. So let's jump straight into it. We've got Elm is not yet a mainstream language. Are there plans to support for IR generation some more mainstream languages that can be used with a functional style? For example, F Sharp, Scala, TypeScript. Who would like to take that one? Probably both of us. <laughs> um, the answer is yes. Uh, so we are actually working with Microsoft Research uh, to, to use their Bosky language as a front end, which I guess you could say is less mainstream than Elm even. But um, the idea is that different languages, um, not and not only languages, even things like decision tables uh, or, or little expression languages that a lot of enterprises have should be able to be a front end um, to, to the IR. Uh, we actually started with Scala. Scala was our first language. Um, and I think Scala 3 makes things a lot easier than Scala 2 did, and we'll probably revisit that. Um, we've talked to the F Sharp team as well. Um, so the answer is, it, it, it's a great question. The answer is yes, we would love to have more languages and technologies. Uh, right. so I just want to add, we rely on a community for that a lot. So if people are interested in doing that, we provide the IR itself. We make it easy to, to generate that IR, uh, but we expect the community to come up with all those other integrations. Great stuff. Next question. Is the IR able to capture all the semantics of the target technology? Is the idea that the front end will be extended with an SDK to capture those semantics? Yeah, and another great question. So, um, so yeah, we start out with a with a really powerful, expressive set of functionality. So we do have an SDK already uh, that basically has been enough for uh, for all the business use cases that we have covered in the past. Um, but it it's open uh, to to extension as well. So that that is another area where we rely on the community. If you run into a use case that is uh, difficult to express uh, with the existing um, with the existing constructs in the IR, we, we are pretty confident that the language itself uh, doesn't need to change. It covers all the use cases. But in terms of the SDK, uh, there might be more optimal ways to describe certain business problems. Uh, and we are open to suggestions on, on that. I think it is is also worth noting that we're focused on business logic. Um, so a lot of the more esoteric features of different languages are not a concern. You know, um, so as we get into things like parallel processing and you know like async and all that, th those are those aren't things that we deal with. Okay, next question. Rather than generate code for multiple languages, how about generate code for a universal runtime such as WebAssembly? That would be great. Yeah, that, that would be great, but I have to mention it doesn't stop there. WebAssembly is, is universal, but it doesn't solve a bunch of problems. Like you cannot use it to replace a, um, a relational database where you, where you wanna run your, your uh, uh, your code close to the data. And so there's there's many other integrations that even that doesn't solve. Uh, in order to, to have something like that, you would need basically a universal execution platform, which uh, simply hasn't been invented yet. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, it's worth noting that, that there's a focus on execution and, and languages supported. There's also the other focus on information. So. I mean, basically, we're, we're peering into the internals of our business logic. Um, and by doing that, we're able to, to automate things like, you know, if your firm has a data catalog and data lineage tools that they need to comply with, you know, those are the kinds of things that beyond the, the execution are important as well in, in the documentation that Attila just showed. Great stuff. I've got a couple more here, unless we get any more. I've got here, thanks for an amazing presentation. How related is this idea to BPMN? Uh, 
Well, all of these, I guess I'll join. All of these are, are fairly related. They're they're kind of um, declarative approaches to to programming. BPMN is a declarative approach to integration and, and workflow. Um, you could you could interchange the, the two. I mean, you can put various bits of business logic in something like Morpher and then glue them together with BPMN into a process that, that is a runtime. Um, so they're all related in different ways. Okay, and I've got a great one to finish on now. It says, would it be possible to try out more for ourselves? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so as uh, it's an open source project, so you, there's a, a repo out there um, the, uh, under the Finos organization, uh, Finos slash Morpher. Um, on the GitHub, uh, so you can you can go there and and try it out. We also have an npm package that you can install and try out the tools that uh, the tools that you can try right now are the ones that I I was demoing, and then um, obviously the 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 tool to go from Elm to the uh, to the actual Morpher IR, um, and then we have uh, the Scala code generator published as well. Uh, but we are con constantly adding more. Uh, we actually have a, a page as well to just play around online. Uh, so you can edit your Elm code and see the IR representation of it. That's really just for learning purposes. You, you cannot really use it to any, like execute anything, uh, but we are also working on that. Uh, technically our tooling is built so that the, all the features that we have uh, can be pretty easily made available online. So we are planning to do that so that you can just go to that page um, and try out the execution and everything uh, on the fly without installing anything. But right now you have to go to the uh, GitHub repo and install it, install the software. That sounds great. Well, listen, that's all we've got time for. So I just want to say thank you so much to all of you for, uh, for speaking today. We really appreciate the time that you've taken to come and do this. I hope everybody's enjoyed this. So thank you to everybody for, for dialing in today as well. As always, the recording of this will go up on the Scott Logic YouTube channel. So you can watch it again there. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.